Herzlich willkommen, guten Morgen. Warm welcome and good morning. Nice to have you with us today. Uh, welcome to this panel discussion uh, here at the Regional Representation of Hessen concerning the priorities of the German Council of Presidency. My name is uh, uh, Detlef Fechner. I'm the uh, Deputy Editor in Chief of the Person Zeitung, and I have the honor to introduce this to you. To listen in English, uh, we have simultaneous interpretation. Sie folgen ein you will follow along for the German channel on the floor, uh, otherwise you have the choice for the English channel. This is a discussion with you and we are happy to take your questions. So if you have any questions, just use our hotline. I spell it, it's uh, the telephone number 0032 for Belgium and then it's 472-03-0181. Oder Sie or else you use the email address, uh, email account, uh, streamline at uh, lv-brussel.hessen.de. There you go. This is a second preliminary remark and a third. The remark is that uh, we will hopefully have a lively discussion, a fruitful discussion, but we will find an end. There are a lot of things today. You are busy, we are busy, and we will uh, conclude this session at 11 o'clock sharp. So you can trust you will have a chance afterwards to have a view on what the uh, European Supreme Court has done with Apple or whatever you would like to do after 11. So we start with the Hessische Ministerin für Bundes- und Europaangelegenheiten with the Minister of European and Federal Affairs of the State of Hessen, Lucia Puttrich. Here is her welcome address. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich darf Sie heute ganz herzlich begrüßen. Warm welcome to all of you for today's event. Here at the Regional Representation of Hessen, but only in a digital format. We would have loved to uh, meet and greet you here, live in Brussels, uh, possibly on our roof terrace as well. But due to the corona crisis, this is not possible, unfortunately. But um, instead of that, we have decided to uh, organize a digital event, and it's uh, great to have you with us here um, today. This event is um, organized by the Banking Association together with the uh, Hessen Regional Representation. Uh, I'd like to uh, give, um, give a warm welcome to Mr. von Mocke, Chief Financial Officer of the Deutsche Bank. It's great to have the Secretary of State at the Federal Ministry of Finance, Mr. Cookies, with us. And a warm welcome as well to Mr. Berrigan, Director General for Financial Stability, Financial Services uh, and Capital Markets Union of the EU Commission. And for those who've been able to join us more often in the past already uh, at uh, the uh, Hessen Regional Representation and for others as well, uh, Dr. Fechner's face is a very um, well-known one. Uh, he's ed Deputy Editor-in-Chief of the Börsenzeitung and facilitator for today's event. It's great to have you with us again. So, ladies and gentlemen, I was telling you for this common uh, uh, set of meetings, uh, uh, today's topic is business and finance, priorities of the German Council Presidency. So, for this event, uh, we have uh, been inviting you uh, cordially in order to learn more about quite interesting aspects. Well, the event is taking place in another format, as originally foreseen, uh, but not only this event, the Council Presidency will be taking place in another format as well. On the organizational level, normally you would meet and mingle and discuss about things at meetings, um, encounter each other personally, but this time a lot of things uh, will have to be discussed in a digital format. Uh, meetings are not possible or only in a reduced format uh, um, in presence of each other. But. Uh, there will be differences in the organizational level, but also in the content area during this presidency. And I'd like to address this, sir. We have other priorities, as it would have been the case a year ago. Who would uh, be, have been thinking of the uh, corona crisis a year ago? We have to cope with this crisis now. This is a huge challenge. This uh, goes for the uh, multi-annual uh, financial framework and for the recovery plan as well. But other topics are present, uh, for instance, the Brexit. What will be happening at the end of the day? Huh? What will be the final result of uh, the negotiations? Will there be an agreement? So we have uh, the two major topics uh, mentioned already, but uh, um, others are coming up as well. What country will get what uh, 
amount of money to cope with the crisis and the German uh, presidency of the council will be uh, taking place under other premises than originally foreseen on Friday and Saturday. There will be a decision or at least uh, hopefully there will be a decision for the multi-annual financial framework uh, because uh, we all of us are depending on a, a result here for uh, planning certainty. Talk about planning certainty, this goes for the long-term planning but for the short-term objectives as well, how will we get uh, out of the crisis, uh, uh, what uh, will be the uh, spending policy for the recovery plan, who will be controlling uh, the type of uh, expenses here, uh, according to what conditions. Uh, Long-time planning involves uh, a stronger and more innovative position out of the crisis for the coming years. The European Union has to be uh, uh, more just and fairer, it has to be uh, in a certain and secure framework uh, and we want to live in a common uh, area where we have common values that are respected and appreciated and we want to live in a European Union that uh, is playing a, a decisive role in the world. And there's topics where you might have thought that they have become of secondary importance, but it's not the case, as for instance, climate change. This is still a topic uh, to uh, cope with. Uh, and uh, it's important as well to have digital and technological uh, sovereignty and to be competitive as well. But uh, another particular aspect of importance today is obviously the financial architecture. We need a more sustainable and stable financial architecture. And it's uh, exactly in this area that we've uh, invited quite interesting guests. We want a European Union uh, where there is a, a level of solidarity uh, uh, and performance uh, for the future in a sustainable way. And to be uh, sustainably set up uh, uh, for the future, we need a transparent and reliable, a responsible spending policy. So a very solid financial uh, policy in the European Union in order to secure the future. And that's why we invited these interesting uh, discussion partners. I wish to all of you an interesting morning session here and lots of new insights. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank, Lucia Putrich, giving us some food for thoughts. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our very distinguished guests. I start with, as we are in Brussels, with John Berrigan. He studied uh, economics in Dublin. He worked with the national government and uh, then he joined European Commission and let me say it like this John, uh, you joined uh, the Commission where I as an extern would say everybody should start his career in the Commission with the agriculture. Then you switched to ECFIN and uh, worked uh, a lot about financial markets, about exchange rates, about uh, financial assistance in the crisis and since uh, since March uh, 2020, you are Director General of DG FISMA. That is the capacity that you are here. And I say hello to you. I think you are joining this debate from Brussels. Is that right, John? That's correct. I'm here in Brussels. Thank you. Then second, uh, we have James von Moltke. He graduated in Oxford. He worked with uh, most of the American banks that I know by heart. You work with JP Morgan, with Morgan Stanley, with Citigroup. You work with uh, Credit Suisse First Boston. In 2017, you came to Frankfurt and uh, joined Deutsche Bank. And you're here in your capacity as representatives of German banks, as well as the CFO of uh, Deutsche Bank. Happy to have you. I uh, assume you are sitting in Frankfurt at this very moment. That's right, Detlef. Thank you. Thank you, James. And last but definitely not least, uh, we have with us uh, Jörg Kukes, who studied in Mainz and in Paris. And uh, we are very jealous uh, to learn that you studied as well at the JFK School of Government. Everybody that I know would like to have some, some semesters over there. You worked with Goldman Sachs for uh, a long time uh, in Frankfurt, in London, in uh, various uh, functions. And uh, then you switched and started a political career, and that is why we have you with us today in your function, in your capacity as Secretary of State uh, with the German Finance Ministry. And we're happy to have you, and I would like to give you the floor for a short keynote. Your cookies, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so um, I think uh, the, the question that uh, uh, most people are asking us at the moment in the European context is uh, 
uh, presidency priorities and uh, what we plan to do over the past over the next six months. And um, I think uh, um, um, I would say as first uh, objective, interacting as much as I can with uh, with my good friend Sean, um, because a lot of the things that I will mention will uh, will include um, cooperation with uh, with uh, FISMA. Um, but um, of course, the the first priority is a is an even broader one, namely to uh, to uh, finalize the agreement on the MFF and the recovery instruments. I think that uh, is needless to say that that has risen um, to the top of the agenda, as uh, Paul Putrich um, outlined. That uh, that is uh, the absolute priority at the moment. Hopefully, we will get a clear guidance from uh, from leaders on um, Friday and Saturday um, to to then start all of the um, legislative activities that we will need to start to actually implement um, and make sure that the money flows from the 1st of January. Um, so so um, the complexity of that is, is very high. Um, we have a good dozen of um, legislative activities that uh, that a decision from leaders will trigger. Um, and um, all of those will be quite involved discussions um, where we then talk about the um, specifics of the allocation, the question of how um, the planned EU debt issuance um, will occur, all of the um, um, legal specificities of the own funds um, um, regulation, the increase of the ceiling to facilitate and allow um, um, market participants um, to um, evaluate the riskiness and the um, the requirements of the debt issuance that hopefully will then lead to um, a successful launch. And so all of these things and many more uh, will of course keep everyone busy and that really shows why um, um, Chancellor Merkel and uh, Finance Minister Schultz have been so clear that they um, uh, want a quick agreement because uh, to make sure that the money flows on the 1st of January, we really need to start um, very, very soon to, to implement all of the measures. Then, um, of course, the, the very important issues around deepening of the CMU, um, the banking union, the digital union will be uh, totally top of our agenda. Um, we will also use the informal echo pin um, to talk about deepening of the fiscal union, i.e. Um, while the recovery instrument is a one-off instrument, um, we will um, um, ha have discussions at the informal echo pin of uh, the future of the European Union. Um, where do we need deepening? Where do we need um, further uh, collaboration and cooperation? So we also want to have this uh, this long-term element of uh, further deepening of the union um, into um, in our program. Um, on the banking union, we've had quite intense discussions um, they, 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 um, over the last weeks. Um, they have they were put on hold temporarily due to the new priority of battling the Corona crisis. I think that was completely correct and legitimate. But uh, we are focused on. Um, picking up the discussion again, and we definitely um, have the goal of coming to specific progress on all of the um, parts of the deepening of the banking union, namely um, um, constructing a true internal market for capital and liquidity, um, talking about further risk reduction, um, and of course also talking about risk sharing because we know that uh, we will only be able to set the incentives for further risk reduction if we also are willing and able to move forward on risk sharing. And we have made a proposal um, at the end of last year um, that could also include um, progress on deposit protection um, um, at the European level, which I think is important. On the capital markets union, um, we've received extremely interesting input, um, first from the, um, from the next CMU group that was mandated by Germany, France, and the Netherlands. Then um, the um, high level forum mandated by the commission, um, which uh, produced an extremely interesting um, um, 100 page plus report with uh, very, very specific proposals on how we can move forward with the capital markets union. Um, that was an extremely um, productive combination of, um, of policymakers, practitioners, supervisors, um, regulators that led to this report. Anyone who hasn't seen it yet, it's publicly available. Um, and, um, and anyone with a, a true interest in the future of European capital markets um, should read it because it's extremely concrete 
Um, it's extremely um, visionary in its concreteness and we will do what we can to help implement it. Um, I think the topic of digital union is sort of a, um, an, a, tr an, a further complement to the banking union and capital markets union discussions. Um, um, we've seen in the past few months that modern banking um, is um, actually doable with a further digitization. I think everyone has um, digitized their lives further and of course banking and capital markets unions uh, won't be um, won't be um, um, exempt from that and I think it's very good and we've already had the first uh, discussions with FISMA um, um, on all of the topics to further accelerate the digitization of our um, financial industry um, ranging from a, a, a regulatory and supervisory framework for the whole um, world of crypto um, we have to address the, um, the, the topic of how um, payments providers are supervised in Europe. Um, I won't dwell on um, Wirecard, but I do think the um, case of Wirecard gives a lot of credibility to our already existing um, discussion on the need to um, have a supervisory framework for the um, significant um, 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 providers of payment services um, and providers of technology services to payment providers. So I think um, one of the um, learnings that we have from the current Wirecard discussion really confirms what we've been discussing with, uh, with uh, the Commission all along, namely um, that irrespective of whether it's uh, uh, Wirecard, it's PayPal, it's the discussion around Libra, um, we urgently need a, um, a uniform and harmonized supervisory framework um, for all of these um, activities which um, effectively um, are part of the financial infrastructure and financial services infrastructure. So I think that um, will be important. Um, then, um, of course, the topic of sustainable finance will be huge. Um, we've just announced that Germany will finally um, join the group of, um, of green bond issuers. Um, um, we will work very intensively on sort of the core project for sustainable finance for us, namely the taxonomy. Uh, we've made good progress under the previous presidencies and we take great pride that we will bring forward, especially the level two regulation on that. Um, last but not least, um, a topic um, that is in the um, very um, 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 able and uh, um, um, hands of uh, Monsieur Barnier, namely Brexit. Um, of course, um, the, the ECOFIN will only be um, sort of affected um, in part by that because the discussions are centralized um, um, and, um, and put forward um, extremely well um, by um, Monsieur Barnier and his team. Um, but of course, uh, we may have some um, sort of, uh, one, if an agreement is reached, then of course there are uh, corollaries to that, um, namely in the area of equivalence. Um, regimes. So um, um, depending on how the negotiations go, we may be um, occupied with that. Um, if the negotiations don't go well, um, we are already making um, plans and updating our plans, um, what would need to be done in the case of a hard Brexit. Um, so I think um, everyone um, who follows closely what the status of the negotiations is um, will have to think very hard about um, um, hard Brexit preparedness, and we're certainly doing that in the German government, and um, if and where needed in the discussion in, uh, discussions in the ECOFIN, we will of course also address that, but um, at the moment we're still hopeful that the negotiations go in the right direction. With that, many thanks, and um, over to the next speaker. Yeah, thank you very much, your cookies, to giving us, us a little bit the tour d'horizon. Uh, giving us a lot of catchwords that we will deepen and we will get more in detail in banking union, capital markets union and the other topics. But before we do that, I would like to ask the two other panelists for a short reply uh, about your expectations with regard to the presidency. Now we have seen a little bit the full picture for business and finance. John Berrigan, for the commission, what is key? What is uh, your expectation from this German Council Presidency. Uh, well, thanks very much for the uh, the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I mean, I think York has sort of covered what is the Commission's priority. So it's very nice to know that our priorities align with those of the Presidency. It's not an accident, of course, because we discuss quite a lot. 
So I have nothing to add to the list, except I might mention that we will bring forward an anti-money laundering package as well in, in, in this part of the presidency, which is also very important and has been somewhat pushed back a bit by the two defining events, I think, of the next six months. One is the response to COVID, which Jörg mentioned, which is the defining context, I think, of all that we do. But of course, there's also this Brexit issue, which is bubbling along and has been bubbling along for many years, but is now about to come, I think, to its, uh, to, to its climax, and this is going to be really important. What do we expect from the German presidency? Well, what I expect is what I'm getting, which is um, a lot of commitment, a lot of ambition. I think we have a huge, as usual, in financial services, a very long and complicated agenda. But um, I have to say that we are impressed already, and this is only a couple of weeks in, by the degree of commitment we are receiving from the, the German presidency. I think it's really important if we take the context of COVID-19, that we get the priorities right. I think CMU is a priority. It is not that CMU, I think, can do a, a huge amount for the very short-term response to COVID. But in fact, what COVID has demonstrated and the crisis is that we really could do with a developed capital market now. We don't have one. So it simply reinforces the ur urgency of making progress in the development of capital markets. And I'm really pleased that the German presidency has identified this as one of their um, as one of their priorities. The other big uh, point I will make, I could go through all the points he made and, and probably agree with all he said, but the other point I would highlight is on digital finance because the one perhaps real positive coming from the confinement element of this crisis has been that the inertia around the digital agenda in general and the digital finance agenda in particular has been largely removed. So a lot of this sort of, I would say, not even skepticism, just pure inertia uh, around this agenda has gone. We now see that we can function digitally, we can function remote. So a lot of the things we were not, say, so enthusiastic about are now on the table uh, and we can make, I think, even more rapid progress. But of course, with every opportunity comes a risk so I think, as you mentioned, I mean, the, the, the opportunities from digital finance are myriad, but the risks alongside are also there. And we have to put in place a framework, a regulatory and supervisory framework that allows us to extract the benefits while controlling the risks. And we will do that. We will put forward uh, an, a strategy for digital finance in this part, uh, in, in the presidency, and also legislation around crypto assets and also operational resilience. I could go on from this, maybe I'll stop there and uh, I'll come back later on some of those points. Yeah, thank you very much, John. And uh, before going a little, little bit more in detail on, into uh, CMU and in digitalization of financial services, I would uh, give you, James von Moltke, as well the chance to, uh, for a more broader reply on uh, what are your uh, expectations, what do you see is key for the German uh, presidency from your perspective? James. Thank you, Detlef, and I'm delighted to be here speaking on behalf of the German Banking Association and also my own institution, Deutsche Bank. Uh, echoing what John just said, I, I think the degree of alignment, speaking, if you like, on behalf of private sector actors with the, um, the official sector is extremely high. Um, so just to cover off banking union, capital markets union, digital finance union, sustainable finance, combating money laundering and terrorist financing, and also the Brexit negotiations, these are all very high on the agenda of, of the banking industry in Germany and around the European Union. Um, we're, we've obviously, I think, all used this crisis environment to um, sharpen the dialogue between the, the private sector and the official sector actors which I think helps in this alignment. Um, and I think we're seeing an opportunity now in the German Council presidency uh, to move a lot of these di discussions, debates that have been ongoing for several years forward, hopefully quickly. Um, and just echoing your Kuki's uh, you know, statement at the beginning, um, it is our hope as well, at the importance of the recovery instruments um, and the negotiations that are ongoing you know, can't be under underestimated and and we also await sort of the outcome of those discussions um, as a as an industry um, our hope as well is that it not uh, completely overshadow 
the potential for for forward motion on on these other agenda items. Um, we, as I say, certainly support those agenda items uh, in the banking union. The potential completion of of EDIS um, is something that that speaking for Deutsche Bank, we would certainly support. On the capital markets union, uh, John mentioned there are many different elements of that agenda. From my perspective, um, securitization and a securitization framework is especially important, I think, for Europe and, and the way the European banking market uh, evolves over the coming years, particularly as we anticipate the introduction of the Basel III final framework. Um, we agree on the digitization agenda, uh, and in that area, uh, I think a focus for the private sector is on achieving both an environment for innovation and a level playing field for um, for actors in um, the sort of more regulated financial services sector and and less regulated. And then, if I think about sustainable finance, there I think we're we're all very much aligned again with that agenda, and we welcome the efforts um, a, a among the in the European Union uh, and the Council uh, and Commission to seek uh, sort of harmonisation of taxonomy and ways um, to bring. Um, if you like, an, an, an organized program to the, to the financial services so we can all line up behind a common definition, common taxonomy, uh, which we think will, would, would advance the, the discussion significantly. So uh, those would be my opening comments and perhaps some things to go into uh, in the panel discussion. Thank you very much, James. So uh, on a general uh, basis, there's a huge agreement, alignment uh, on the positions. Let's go a little bit more in detail. I'm sure that we have uh, a little bit more controversial uh, points to find there. I would like to start, James, with you again and uh, ask you about, uh, well, the banking industry, they appreciate very much the very prompt and decisive reaction of regulators and supervisors to COVID-19. But now, uh, as it uh, goes on, is much more needed, is more needed, or on the other hand side, are you scared that uh, they will start a phasing out of all these things that uh, they uh, try to, to help you and support you as banks? Uh, what is your opinion on that? So look, I think, as I said, the, the engagement and dialogue, particularly in, in March and April, was extremely high. And I think the industry appreciates the, the quick and very prompt action from a variety of actors in the official sector, whether it was uh, the EBA, the ECB, the Commission, and the, and the national governments. Um, I think that much has been achieved. Um, there were certainly some things on, if you like, the wish list that the banks had uh, that, that haven't been uh, sort of, call it addressed. Um, highest uh, on, on our list might have been uh, some relief on the single resolution fund contribution or assessment for, for this year. Uh, as in our minds, that's withdrawing about nine billion of capital from the banking sector um, at a time when it might be better deployed, um, you know, supporting lending. But overall, you know, I, I, we, I can't say enough about how prompt the action was in the official sector. I think the one challenge we perhaps going have going forward is is some of the actions are time barred, um, which of course means that they're a little bit less useful in terms of the the how the capital markets will will look at them and frankly the longer range uh, capital planning for the bank but that isn't to take away from the the benefits i think that that uh, the banking sector was able to draw and and the ability to again mobilize capital in the balance sheets was um, was very valuable as well as the the broader just statements of of um, uh, of good cooperation as i say between the private and the official sectors i think were helpful uh, for the market in, in understanding that the banks would be able to provide the kind of support to the real economy that, that, uh, that we're all seeking. Thank you, James. <clears throat> Jörg, uh, Cookies, I would like to ask you um, how, how you handle that now. Uh, you have to think about phasing out of uh, some of these uh, measures because they were uh, prompt but short term. Um, you see that uh, things are very, uh, very difficult to predict and that you need the banks and to support the banks. So uh, what is the role of Europe in that game? Are you uh, trying to coordinate uh, that there is a common exit? Uh, what does it make for all your scheduling? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, 
We're not at all in the mode of exiting from our measures. Quite to the contrary, uh, what keeps us busy at the moment is still implementation of sort of the, the second round of the measures that we've taken. Um, so we're still um, doing a lot with uh, KFW on our programs um, to refine the lending um, opportunities that we give to, uh, to German corporates on those. Uh, we're still working with um, um, KFW Capital and the startups um, to make the very new um, and innovative um, measures of um, providing financing for for startup um, for startups more efficient. We're still working at the European level um, to implement uh, the three pillars of the April program, namely the ESM. Uh, program for a um, facility to to um, help um, member states to finance health-related uh, implications of COVID. The second pillar with EIB, um, we're discussing literally as we speak, um, to implement the program of guarantee provision to um, to lending and um, financing for SMEs across Europe. And we're working with the Commission on SURE, i.e. the program to promote um, short-term labor schemes and promotion of um, um, financing of unemployment schemes across the European Union. So as you can see, um, we're more in, um, we're more in, um, in the mode of um, actually implementing what we decided and rolling it out and making sure it works. Because I think the, the lesson from the financial crisis of 2008-2009 was certainly that, uh, that there was initially a prompt response but sort of the second round uh, was probably too quick austerity in too many uh, regions of the European Union, which then led to a very asymmetric um, um, path of uh, crisis response where some member states uh, continued recovering, but others um, didn't and, uh, and entered into sort of a, 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 a much deeper crisis two or three years later. So I think that's exactly uh, what we have to avoid. And that's why we're putting so much effort a, into implementing the measures that we decided, both at the national and the European level, and rolling out a new uh, instrument for financing, um, namely the recovery instrument, which will also, um, during the years of 21 and 22, um, um, predominantly make sure that, uh, that the recovery is actually sustainable um, and works in the long run and isn't um, counteracted by, um, by contractionary um, measures on the fiscal side at a too early stage. Um, we'll of course have to return to the path of uh, solidity of uh, public finances um, if and when um, is, is possible, but um, I think we first need um, the economy to pick up before we um, start discussing the exit already. Thank you. And uh, just a very concrete follow-up because James mentioned it, uh, thinking about uh, single resolution fund and the contributions. Is this an issue that uh, you discussed with your colleagues or uh, is there not much hope for the banks that their part, this part of the wish list will be fulfilled? Yeah, I mean, it was discussed. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't uh, find an agreement on that point, um, I mean, the German government was open to essentially just moving um, the the contributions to the single resolution fund backwards by one year, um, i.e., saying that uh, we can uh, we can pause for one year, but that we then um, make up for that um, and keep the volume constant by um, adding one additional year at the end of the contribution period. But uh, we didn't find consensus among uh, the member states for that proposal and other proposals that were made um, um, also didn't even come close to finding a majority such as uh, reducing the size of the single resolution fund, um, etc. So in that sense, unfortunately, that's an area where we didn't um, find consensus across Europe. Thank you. Uh, John, uh, we have now uh, sometimes already spoken about the Basel framework. Uh, so what does COVID-19 mean for the scheduling and not just that we, we know that there are things which are now postponed, but for uh, postponing uh, the, the content of, of uh, Basel. Is there any discussion on that? Uh, do we have any uh, ideas what, uh, is in, uh, what is moving target, uh, what is fixed? Can you give us a little bit uh, an insight? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, well, let me just, before I go to Basel, just, just I echo what um, what Jorg has just said is that you know and, and and what has been said by James that 
you know, I think the, the acute phase of this crisis was all about liquidity and all about the bank's role in injecting liquidity into the real economy. So it was important that we responded to that with the right measures and the dialogue with the bank was very essential and was very good. I, I, I think to, you know, explain why certain things were not delivered and some things were, you have to understand that in order to be quick, you need kind of three conditions. Things have to be very clearly targeted at what was COVID related. Things have to be time constrained because that was a basis of consensus. And then there had to be this consensus around the table, a broad consensus. It didn't have to be 100%, but we needed to have a, a feeling it would get through. So the, the CRR quick fix was quick because the elements inside it met these three criteria. So other things were on the table, but didn't meet the three criteria and therefore we couldn't get it. So not everybody's wishes were met but we got as much as we could within that group in, in the quick fix. Now, Basel is, a, is, a, is running alongside. Now, Basel, what we did on Basel was to postpone it by a year, and it takes the form of operational relief. So nothing within Basel, nothing within the agreement has been changed. But the operational relief was that things were pushed back to give the banks more time to focus on other things than preparing for, for this. Uh, there has been within Basel so far not particular, no particular debate about changing the construction of the agreement. We are, of course, working on our proposal based on the Basel agreement, which we will put forward most likely by the end of this year or very early next year. Uh, we have been given a little bit more time because of the postponement of the deadlines, but since we were already a little bit behind, we are going to sort of use some of that time to at least make our proposal. Um, but the process is dynamic. I mean, the, the one thing I will say about the current environment is that in my rather long time in economics, too long, I think, this has been the, probably the situation of most uncertainty I've ever worked in. I have never seen a situation where public policy is having to work in conditions of this uncertainty. We simply don't know, first of all, how the pandemic is going to evolve. We're not sure how the economy is going to react to that evolution of the pandemic. There are all sorts of behavioral and structural changes that may have taken place underneath the confinement. So we simply don't fully understand our environment. So what I will say to you is that while there's no discussion today about changing the Basel Agreement, our view in total is rather dy dynamic. So when you talked about, you, know, you asked Jörg about possibly ending measures, we have to keep everything under constant review. The situation is so uncertain that we have to be very dynamic, I think, in our approach to public policy. So while we're not discussing anything about changing Basel today, we're not even discussing further postponements of Basel today. What I will say to you is that we will we have to keep the whole the whole regulatory framework under review dy dynamically, because we simply don't know where we're going to be six, nine, twelve months from now. Thank you, John. And uh, let's uh, switch to the issue of Capital Markets Union. Uh, James, you have already uh, given us some ideas. Are there any low-hanging fruits? Are there any uh, things which could be fixed quick in the capital markets? Uh, is there anything that you would like to ask politics regulators to do um, to support Capital Markets Union uh, very um, in the foreseeable future and not just the, the huge uh, issues that we talked about like insolvency and so on. Uh, if, if you could decide a little bit the agenda, is there one, two, three topics that you would like to bring on the agenda? Uh, please, James. Sure. Uh, well, look, and, and I, I think that in the recent paper that, that your cookies referred to, uh, there was as much as, as 110 separate uh, recommendations, which shows you the, the scope of, of what is meant by capital markets unions. And so it's, you know, it's hard to pick out from that the things that are, 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 are most critical. And to your point about the three conditions to see action, you know, how one uh, you know, creates consensus around those, those items. Um, if I can actually just draw back to the Basel III final framework discussion that we had a moment ago, I think the two are related. So the ability of the the, the banking industry and the financial services provision in Europe to adapt to the Basel III final framework, I think, coheres very much with the capital markets union, uh, in part, as I mentioned earlier, because I think securitization will, will have to be a bigger part of the puzzle for Europe going forward. 
especially as the Basel III framework, um, you know, essentially makes capital costs for example to lending to unrated um, uh, small and medium-sized corporates or mortgage lending, um, you know, more capital consumptive on bank balance sheets. Uh, and so that's certainly an area we'd want to work in, work closely with um, with the official sector on. I, I will say also related to Basel, Basel III final framework, we had had, I think, a very constructive dialogue as Europe, both the European Banking Federation, the, the, the Bankenverband, had had um, created sort of quite clear advocacy positions and suggestions on on how to implement it within the framework. And so, as John says, consistent with what the FSB is was seeking, uh, but in ways that are more sympathetic to the specific environment that we're in uh, in Europe and the nature of our our um, you know financial markets and financial institutions. And so to the extent that some of that can be picked up in the capital markets union discussion, I think that's helpful. I do agree, as you briefly alluded to, um, you know, insolvency uh, um, regimes, the harmonization thereof, as well as tax regimes, are probably the, the big nuts to try to, to tackle um, and may be difficult to get alignment on at least quickly. Um, but there are, are smaller elements of, of the Capital Markets Union uh, suggestions that, of course, we would, we would welcome. Thank you, James. Yeah, uh, your cookies coming to the issue of large payment service providers. You mentioned uh, that the, they should generally be subject to financial supervision, and you said uh, you are looking for a harmonized framework for that. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on that? What, what does this mean, a harmonized uh, framework? What was the European uh, role in this context, content? Yeah, I, I think we need, um, we need um, both harmonization and uh, moving things to the European level. Um, I mean, as uh, Sean and, um, and James outlined on uh, money laundering, um, which of course is always a corollary to the payments business. Um, we are of the firm belief that um, that the time of uh, directives should end, and we should have a uh, a full harmonization um, um, uh, through a regulation that makes uh, makes the European standards applicable across the Union um, without exceptions. Um, we also think that we need a, a supervisory authority to control that um, that uh, then uniform framework. So I think that's um, something that will actually help um, innovative business models. Whenever we talk to startups in this uh, in this payment sector, they tell us that uh, their American competitors are scalable much quicker because they have 50 states with widely uniform um, AML, KYC, and other rules, whereas in Europe, um, despite the um, promise of the Lisbon Treaty of an internal market, you still need 27 onboarding um, um, programs and 27 member states. You need, still need 27 different regimes of uh, money laundering control, and of course that makes both the startups um, less scalable and the existing banks' business models across Europe much more cost-intensive and less efficient. So I think that's that's uh, extremely important. On the payments providers, um, I think we just need to um, understand um, that uh, that the big players in this um, in this uh, business are um, not domestic at all. Um, they're global, so ideally they should be um, supervised and regulated at the global level, um, um, but at least they should be supervised and regulated at the European level because um, their business models are so pan-European and so um, global that I think uh, um, everyone doing it themselves at the national level, um, A, creates inefficiencies, and B, of course, creates um, opportunities um, for those um, uh, who um, are engaged um, to create regulatory arbitrage by basically converging to the member state with the lowest level of, um, of supervision and regulation. So I think that's extremely important to have a common regime there. Um, I mean, um, the, the payments business, I think, um, needs quite a few um, areas of strengthening. On the one side, um, Europe is very successful. We have um, several um, um, startups and companies that are that are um, active in this space. Um, so I think it's it's also an, a huge opportunity to create growth. And then, I mean, we've seen, we, we passed a, a law at the end of last year implementing the AML directive 
that put um, um, the custody of um, crypto assets under a secure and uh, reliable um, regulatory framework. And we've received several dozen applications of blockchain um, startups um, who want to set up um, um, shop in Germany because of the solidity and reliability of the regulation. So I think um, as long as we do it in an intelligent way, this uh, can also open the door to a more, um, a more efficient, uh, scalable, um, innovative industry that uh, that will create jobs. So I think um, I think that it could it could go um, if we do this right. It could actually be a very powerful instrument uh, both for existing businesses and for um, innovative uh, startup businesses. Thank you. Well, um, we will talk in a minute about the digital financial services a little bit more in depth. Um, I cannot do without, we have uh, the first questions and uh, not surprisingly, your cookies, there are questions as well for Wirecard. This is not the, uh, the place uh, for discussing in, 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 in depth uh, Wirecard, but I would like to ask you, because that was one of the questions, uh, would, uh, would you like to take the uh, opportunity to comment on, on your talks to Mr. Brown, which is one question uh, on in this occasion, or would you uh, do that on other, in other occasion. No, I mean the the policy of the German government, and this is not my decision or anything, uh, is not to comment in public on bilateral discussions between the German government and um, and um, individual companies. Um, so that's uh, um, a very clear policy. Um, that's uh, not a specific um, decision of my uh, individual. Um, choice. So in that sense, um, obviously uh, no comment on that one. We have informed Parliament in the um, in, in the way that is foreseen, i.e. on a confidential basis of the contents of my meeting um, with uh, with Mr. Brown, and, and you know that's the that's the uh, foreseen way where how the government deals with this. So the the Parliament is informed. Um, as per last Friday already, and um, and um, that's the um, the rest is up to the policy making of the German government. Um, on Wirecard in general, as I said, um, for us transparency is is um, absolutely key, um, and um, we are in discussions, as Finance Minister Schulz has said, on um, a analyzing what went wrong. Um, and be drawing the conclusions that need to be drawn um, both at the legislative, the supervisory um, um, level. And there's many, um, many conclusions to be drawn. A um, is the system of audit control that we have um, appropriate. Um, B, um, what do we need in terms of additional supervision and regulation for the payment providers um, and for those um, companies that have a core bank um, but around that, a lot of technology service provision to um, other serv financial service providers, um, and see do we need what kind of um, 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 additional enforcement mechanisms do we need? You know, do we need a European version of the SEC? Um, that's also a, a question that ties into uh, the um, the debate around the Capital Markets Union, um, where we have uh, where we have a very um, uniform and strong market supervision in the United States and a very dispersed one um, in the European Union. So I think those are the, uh, the those are the questions that we're discussing. Um, of course, we need to analyze um, what went wrong first, and we're doing that extremely diligently and um, intensively. Um, um, but in parallel, we are already um, um, discussing what the conclusion should be. Thank you very much, your cookies. Um, switching over to the banking union issue, because we have questions to the banking union as well. Um, John, uh, what is your outlook for the next months uh, uh, in terms of uh, deposit protection as well as banking union as a whole? Uh, your cookie said there will be some initiatives uh, concerning risk reduction and risk sharing. Um, is this now coming to an end, this uh, never-ending story, or are there chances that we come closer to uh, a consensus, John. Please. Um, well, I'm 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 an eternal optimist, and I'm internally optimistic around banking union, and I have to be because it's a it's a file on which we made, as you recall, very rapid progress early on, and that was in the period, I suppose, following the 2008-2009 crisis, when there was a lot of pressure on the system, and we made a lot of progress around banking union. I mean, we shouldn't underestimate how far we've come. Often in discussing how far we have to go, we forget the progress we actually made. We have a single supervisor now, we have a single resolution framework. 
So we are now talking about completing something and we're not starting from, from scratch. I, I think, you know, the issues on, on the table now are very difficult. Uh, we are, you know, we're coming down to some very, very sensitive, sensitive matters. But what I think we have done is, and I think you all will agree on this, by, by, by laying out the, sort of the full picture of banking union, what banking union would look like its entirety, we have set up a set of issues where people can see how the whole, the whole process hangs together. And so it's, it's, it, it is a package. Everybody will have to be happy with everything in the, in, the, in, the, in the banking union. And I think this is a better way of proceeding because if you proceed kind of sequentially point by point, uh, some points are obviously more sensitive for some people than others. And they will, many will, will not be willing to discuss point A unless they have some reassurance about how point B and how point C is going to be handled. So this means we have to handle a broad range of issues together. It means that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, but that doesn't mean we can't make pro progress. And it doesn't mean that you know, consensus is, is only emerging sort of uniformly across the piece. We know there is probably more consensus among the member states, but by no means full consensus around what possible deposit insurance scheme might look like. There is more consensus among member states around how we have to perhaps reform the crisis management system to make it more functional because it's clear that it has been a difficult framework to Im implement uh, over the last few years. And then we get to issues where I think there might be less consensus now, but where we have to keep working to develop it. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic. I'm encouraged by the degree of commitment shown by the presidency to reopen this discussion because as Jörg said, it was slightly distracted. We were moving along, then COVID hit we had to sort of turn our attention to something else. But the German presidency has now decided to put the attention back on banking union. That's good. And I, I, I think there is the making of a package there, but it's going to be hard work. There's a lot of political sensitivities around issues, but I'm essentially optimistic that we will, we will make progress and we will get to the end of this and probably not in, within the German presidency, but a progress will be made in the German presidency and we'll make steps. And ultimately, we will get there to something that makes a sort of a completed, you know, efficiently functioning banking union. Because one thing we have to be aware of is that a half-finished banking union is not an efficient banking union. So, John, thank you very much. So maybe we need a little bit more patience, but uh, you are talking about progress and uh, the importance that we're coming forward with that and coming closer to what is the completed banking union. James von Moltke, uh, I would like to uh, raise my final question, my final topic, which is digitalization. Um, are there any things, are there any rules, any uh, regulations, any um, uh, chances for the government to support the digitalization of the banking industry? Um, so is there, are there any expectations to regulators and uh, um, to supervisors when it comes to digitalization to make it easier for you as a bank uh, to become digital? Well, you know, if I, if I go back to both of the last two conversations, you know, uh, on banking union, as John addressed, and then uh, sort of a digital finance uh, that Jörg was, was speaking to, uh, from our perspective, uh, in, in these areas, the goal is a level playing field across competitors so that we can all innovate, we can all, you know, pr you know, come up with new products and services for our customers, not just in our national markets, but potentially across Europe. Um, I think that that, uh, that does apply to the digitization of finance, um, for sure, um, and, and the ways in which the governments um, and regulators can, can help to foster that market. I think one area that's especially going to be especially important here is as the use of data. Um, so how data uh, should be um, secured, how financial institutions are able to use data, of course, how, how the digitization of finance will interact with GDPR, that will be a, an important element of, of how we together evolve that, that marketplace. Um, I think partnerships between the finance sector and the technology sector will be critical. Um, uh, as you may have seen last week, we announced uh, as Deutsche Bank a partnership with, with Google uh, 
or a letter of intent to to advance our transition into cloud, but but equally to be able to accelerate our ability to create and um, you know new products and capabilities uh, for digital finance for our clients. Um, uh, and and we will need to work uh, sort of quickly on that because again, as Jörg pointed out, um, it's it's a very competitive world out there, uh, and one in which uh, I the, the the challenge, of course, is that our U.S. competitors and also Asian competitors are moving very very quickly, um, and so we have a little bit of a you know a dilemma as to how we foster innovation, but also. Um, hopefully will be a, a, a leader in terms of, of consumer protection, data protection globally. So aligning those two objectives where I think Europe can, can, can be in a leadership position glo globally. Hopefully that, that helps uh, sort of raise a few of the issues that are, are highest as we think about that agenda point, Detlef. Definitely, it helps. Thank you very much, James von Moltke. With that, I would like to conclude our uh, panel discussion here. Thank you very much for this very frank discussion uh, to all the three panelists. I think we have enough uh, food for discussion afterwards. It was uh, concise in a time where things are very difficult to predict and you were uh, courageous enough to, to look a little bit ahead even if you are not quite sure if everything will go like you would like to, it to see to go. Uh, thank you very much as well for everybody who watched uh, this panel discussion and listened to it. Thank you very much for your patience and your, for your engagement. Thank you for the questions we received. Thank you for the interpretation. Das war sehr hilfreich. Vielen Dank, dass Sie uns übersetzt haben. And thank you last but definitely not least to the Hessische Landesvertretung hier in Brüssel und uh, and here in Brussels and the Banken, uh, Banking Association, Bankenverband, thank you for making this possible. So at the end, we will end in German language as well. I hope it was useful to all of you. I've learned a lot uh, and I can uh, go deeper into my reflections now. Thank you for that. And that's the end of our panel discussion. Thank you very much for your kind interest and have a good day.